Years before COVID, I went through a bread making phase. Are any of you bread makers? Yeah, several of you, you will know what I did wrong. <laughs> we went to visit some friends and they make their own bread and it was delicious. My friend Lindsay told me what to do and sent me home with a sourdough starter. Armed with my life motto, how hard could it be? I got the flour and the yeast and made my first loaf. Then and there, I decided we wouldn't buy grocery store bread anymore. My family was generous. The bread was okay right out of the oven, but not amazing. It was close to the right shape, but often had a crack or a seam in the wrong place. It looked like the right texture until you took a bite, and then you realized it was super dense. Making bread all the time is time consuming, and fresh bread that you make at home is really only good for a couple days, and that's when you make it well. Jesus offers us living bread. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. This gospel, for those who are counting, is the fourth week of the Bread of Life discourse. The first week it was the feeding of the 5,000. August 1st, Jesus told his followers to work for the food that endures for eternal life, and not just that which fills our bellies. By last week, the people were beginning to question the whole thing. They saw the miracle, they understood it, but they began to wonder, is not this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose mother and father we knew? We know, you know, that whole, like, I knew him when he was knee-high to a cricket. And now this. Jesus says again that he is the bread of life. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The people don't understand. How can this man give us flesh to eat? Those who have been in the church may not find this language unsettling. Each week in each of the Eucharistic prayers, the celebrant says, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. But 2,000 years ago and even today for people who are unfamiliar, this is bizarre. What does he mean, eat his flesh? Jesus is not speaking literally, he is foreshadowing what is on the horizon, but they don't get that yet. Jesus knows that he will die, that he will be executed so that we all can live forever. And bread is a metaphor that the people will understand a lot about. Bread is ordinary. It requires ordinary ingredients. That day we drove home from our friend's house. I only had to stop for yeast. I had all the other ingredients already and probably more than one kind of bread at home. Bread was ordinary in Jesus' time, too. It was unspectacular and even tasteless when God sent bread from heaven to the starving exiles. The people cry out because they are starving, and manna comes from heaven. Manna comes from heaven. And no sooner do they get, that, get it than they start complaining about it. If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. When they were slaves, that is. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. This miracle of God sending manna from heaven that they collect and bake into cakes and eat to fullness even that isn't the miracle that Jesus is about to give. But here, as people follow Jesus around, drinking in his miracles, Jesus knows what will happen, and he plants the seeds so that in the future, when they eat ordinary bread, each time we eat ordinary bread, we will remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. Thinking about making bread reminds me of my friend Lindsay, who still makes her own delicious bread. And there are so many things like that, ordinary things that bring loved ones near and far to mind. Preaching here in this glorious place 
reminds me every time of my dad, who was a priest and who would be so proud. My mother-in-law's sweet potatoes are the taste of Thanksgiving for me. There's a cross in my office that hung in my grandma's house. There's a necklace that I wore, wear often that my mom bought me on a trip to Korea. There's a ring on my finger that my husband bought me almost 20 years ago. What are the things in your life like these? The fairly ordinary objects and lessons that remind you of the love you feel for and have received from those you love. What does your mom's voice say in your head? Long after when they have died, these things will keep them living for you. This is the seed that Jesus is planting. He knows that he will soon die for us so that we will have eternal life. And when that happens, he know that this strange thing he said, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh, will suddenly make sense. And that each time the people eat bread, we will understand that this bread, this ordinary bread, will sustain us to the next meal. But Jesus died to sustain us forever. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. Making bread is not complicated. Flour, liquid, yeast, heat, a couple other things. The hard thing about bread is the making, mixing, kneading, baking. A few months after I had quit making bread, I mentioned to a different friend that I had gone through a bread-making phase. She asked why I'd stopped, and I explained that my bread was so dense that it was a whole meal in a slice, and not in a good way. She was a bread baker and knew right away what I'd done or didn't do. How long are you kneading? She asked gently. I exaggerated and said, maybe five minutes? She laughed. That was my error. It turns out that when a recipe says to knead for 20 minutes, they don't mean for 20 minutes or until mixed. I don't know if you've ever kneaded bread, but it is hard. I eventually got a stool so I could lean over the counter and use gravity and my body weight to help, but still 20 minutes is a long time to push and fold and turn dough. And cutting that corner meant that I learned a few years earlier than COVID, the lesson that so many others did, that grocery store bread is good enough most of the time. <laughs> it fills the belly and gets us to the next meal. Being Christian is also not complicated. Understanding Jesus' parables, understanding what he meant in the allegories, these can be challenging, but the basic ingredients he made, pretty simple. You all remember, I know some of you will, what are the two great commandments? Love God. And love your neighbor, yay! Pretty soon we will share in Holy Communion, bread and wine for us. And this meal will remind us of the love of God given so abundantly that even after we receive our fill, there will be 12 baskets left over. And nourished with this love, we will be sent out into the world to give it away. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Those who consume God's love abide in God and God abides in them. Being Christian isn't complicated. The challenge is in the mixing, kneading, and baking. The living out of this thing we are. The hard work of Christianity is bearing witness, doing our best to do what Jesus would do when we are busy or distracted or tired or overwhelmed, it takes more time and effort than I think it will every time. Luckily, Jesus is the bread of life, and I can go there any time and get my fill, 
and know all the time that it is mine forever and yours too. We don't have to make the bread anymore, but choosing to follow, to call ourselves Christians, means to do the hard work and share the good news. To love our neighbor, be kind, take care, give of our blessings, to listen, to offer people time and look them in the eye, to react to people who think and look and are different than us with curiosity and wonder, to see God in every person. It's hard. It will take more than five minutes. But Jesus did the hardest part for us, and now we do our part for him.